Glad you could join us today again. We have always got something tremendous to say to your heart. You understand this, and people have been writing to us about this over the years, so I know this to be a fact. This, uh, this ministry, the word that comes forth on this channel, uh, it's not just informative. It's, it's not just teaching you what the Bible says. It, it's more not, it's prophetic. Because I know many of you are during the week, you're going through trials, tribulations. Sometimes you've gone through things for a season. Sometimes you've gone through for months. And you're asking God for a word. Lord, can I have direction? Would you give me a word? God, what do I do? How do you do it? And many times, on just one sermon, one message out of 40 minutes or 45 minutes it's spoken of, uh, out of one, one sentence, one paragraph, one word can be just for you. I seek God about every message so as what I can say is more than just knowledge. Uh, it, 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 it knowledge is revelation that goes to your heart, but that answers the questions that you need to know. I know we do a general talk, but in that general talk there will be a word, and I know there will be a word for you. I know you're sitting poised, you're sitting with your pen and paper and ready to go. So I have a word for you. We're going to have a title and a subject, and we're going to go through it for a little while. Uh, we maybe continue this for a week or two, but at least we're going to start something today. It's called, It Pays to Wait. It Pays to Wait. Uh, in Psalm 40, in Psalm 40 it said this, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me. He heard my cry, and he brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the merry clay, and set my feet upon a rock, and he's established my, my goings. And he's put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear, and shall trust in the Lord. Now, almost at the end of this message, we're going to look into that particular verse uh, uh, and get some, some real gems out of that. If we only spoke on that alone, would be fantastic. But we've got to work our way to there, and so I want to do that. We're talking about waiting on the Lord, and it pays to wait. Waiting on the Lord. Waiting is not really in the vocabulary of the believers nowadays, uh, especially in the younger generation. We don't want to wait. We want it, and we want it now. We, we look for messages on how to speak and to get it, and how to believe now and to get it. And We won't talk about history, or we won't talk about tomorrows. We want it now. Well, uh, that's not the way it works. Sometimes things take a lifetime for a promise to come to pass in the Bible. You've got to understand that, so we're walking through that for you this morning. No, people about my age, young ones, switch off for a few minutes, you won't know what I'm talking about. But people in my era, my generation, my age will understand. For years, it took like four weeks for a letter to get from here to Australia when your folks moved to Australia in my young days. Yeah, your uncle wrote a letter, he went there to work, and four weeks later you got a, you got a message. Now you get a tax message in four seconds. Back then you waited four weeks on the blue letter, the email coming in, or the uh, blue letter coming in from another country. Do you remember sitting watching the saucepan because you put the water on to boil? There was no other way to do it. I don't know if you remember that, but I do. do you, I remember watching television, the old black and white television, and they had just invented a new electric kettle, uh, and it was made by Swan. And they even advertised, they said it'll boil, for, it'll boil in one minute, and then they put the advert on, on uh, the clock, and you came back in one minute later, and you couldn't believe it because the kettle was boiled. Because we had been used to sitting watching the saucepan boiling forever on the stove. And let me tell you something, back then it was waiting. Then the microwave came, and you couldn't hardly understand how the 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 15 seconds was a lifetime in a microwave we have and the washing machines that you sat at the front and you watched the shirts go round and round. Life has changed, but the Bible hasn't. No, the principles of the Bible hasn't changed either. And you will find, now listen to me, this is a principle you need to know. You will find that waiting on the Lord is a big one. It is a real big one. It's vital in the kingdom of God. If you're not learning, if you don't know anything about waiting on the Lord right now, you're probably in trouble already. Waiting on the Lord is big in the kingdom. Two things will happen if you don't. Either you'll run ahead of God, or, or the other one, you'll lag behind God. In other words, both ways, you're both out of the will of God. And I know a lot of believers sitting there, and they wonder why nothing ever happens to them. It's because you're not waiting on the Lord. You're not hearing clear instructions. You don't know if you're coming or going. Timing is everything in the kingdom of God. That's why you wait on the Lord for the timings. His timings is perfect. 
You don't have to wait to get saved. You can get saved right now. You can get saved in a second of time, day and night, anywhere in your lifetime. You call on the name of the Lord. Uh, repent and he will save you in a second of time. But it's after you get saved. It's when you receive Jesus Christ into your heart and it's suddenly, uh, now you're a born again child of the living God and you have, a, you have a destiny ahead of you. You have the will of God and the plans of God that's now lying ahead for you to be fulfilled. But brother and sister, and are listening to me, to fulfill them, you've got to learn to wait on the Lord. When you wait on the Lord, you get clear instructions. If you're not getting instructions, hold off until you do. He'll give you clear instructions. His instructions also carry the time. He has a plan for you. God has a specific plan for your life, for everyone. And it, it, let me tell you, it's a perfect plan. You can write that down. It's a perfect plan. It fits you exactly. It's a fantastic plan. And it perfectly suits who you are. To reject that plan, or for to miss that plan, or never know there is a plan, let me tell you, you'll probably miss the best days of your life. When I look past the times when God spoke and I did it, they're the best days. The things that happened to me, fantastic. Let me tell you something, to reject the plan, because God sometimes will give you the plan. He says, I'm not doing that. No way I'm going. There's no way I'm going to die. Reject the plan. I'm telling you something, it is disastrous, disastrous for your life. You'll never enjoy life. There'll always be that emptiness in it. You'll, you'll never have what God wants you to have. You'll never see the things that God wants you to see. I know people and they do, oh, they just work, 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 work hard. They're almost 24 hours a day. Work, 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 work. But they never enjoy life. They're just working and they're enjoying because you're not fulfilling the plans of God. Somewhere you've got it wrong. You, you'll, you'll never even know where you are in the will of God for your life until you take time to listen to them, until you find out about that plan. If you reject the plan and you reject the timing, sometimes we got the plan, but we don't go with the timing. I say, God, you're taking too long, so I'm going on ahead without you. Wrong deal. Or else you turn around and say, and, 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 and God says, I want you to do it. And you say, no, I'm, I'm too busy. I'm not going to do it. No, I'd rather have her. I'd rather have him. I'd rather go to that church. And, and God's trying to move you at the because there's specific times. And if you lose the specific times, you'll probably lose the whole deal. And it's understand because God doesn't, well, sometimes he gives you a glimpse of the whole picture. Remember last week, he brings you around this side and lets you see the big picture. I understand that, but usually he doesn't let you see the whole deal. He doesn't let you see every intimate detail. It's as you go. And so it's one step at a time. The Bible says that the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. The steps. I think God makes it that way because that way you've got to keep coming to him. That way you've got to come into his presence. You've got to sit there. You've got to say, where is it now and what do you want me to do? If he showed it to you all, you probably wouldn't run in. But because you have to go back again and again and again, you get acquainted with them. You get to love them when you're there. You get to hear things you've never heard in your lifetime before. And in most people, they never consider God even in their life. They, they don't think there's a will for They don't think there's a plan. They just get on with life. And, and, and you got to understand, and mo most people, they never give God even one thought in a day. They maybe turn up to church at Easter or Christmas seldom do they turn up the, on a weekly basis and can't understand how you come to three times a week into a prayer meeting can't, just for the life of them can't understand it because God's not in their thinking. God's not in their thoughts. Sometimes they get a little bit of an education or they get a good job or, or they find somebody to fall in love with and God just disappears out of the equation. They, they, at that point, really, it's arrogant because they think they know better than God. And then seldom do they ask God, why was I created? Why am I here? What is the plan for my life? And what do you want me to do now? And those people become very miserable. The, the, the planet is covered with miserable people. Some of them are miserable. They got lots of money, but they're miserable. They got a lot of, lots of entertainment, but they're miserable because they've got an emptiness on the inside. They've got a deep unhappiness, so they try to fill it up with drink or with drugs or with relationships. They're basically, in a few years, they've tried everything. And then they come to a conclusion, nothing works. No, nothing like that will ever bring happiness. For God's plans are never fulfilled with homemade re re uh, uh, recipes or remedies. 
God's plans are fulfilled when you go to him and say what, where, and when, and make yourself available for him. When you do that, real life begins. Timing, the timings of God are exact, and the timings of God is very important. This is why we've got to go to him and say, well, 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 what do you think, God? Or what do you think of this? And what would you like me to do? You've got to go to him in the mornings and say, what do you like me to do today? Is there somebody I need to call? Is there somebody I need to phone? Here's the way I like to put it. Get connected early. Get, get connected early and then stay connected the rest of the day. If you'll do that, then you'll find that he'll begin to talk to you. Places to go, phone calls will come, things will begin to happen. Because most of the world lives their life disconnected, absolutely disconnected, until something happens. And then when something bad happens, they come running to the Lord, and then they want to know what exactly God wants to do. And God's mercy from these graces, and he pulls them out of it, and then they go back into the lifestyle. Let me tell you, that's not God's best for you. That's not life at all. God promises you life and life in abundance, but you've got to come to him for it. In Psalm 27 and verse 11, it says, Teach me thy ways, O Lord. I don't know how many times over the years I've said that, Lord, teach me. I still say it, teach me. I don't know it all. I know, and in the light of what I'm supposed to know, I probably know very little. <coughs> but I'm learning, and I'm determined to learn more. Psalm 27 verse 11, Teach me thy ways, O Lord. And lead me in the plain path. Isn't that good? In the plain path. The simple path. Because we can make life complicated. Now listen to this. Teach me thy ways, O Lord. Lead me in the simple path. Here it is. Because of mine enemies. You have an enemy. Well, I didn't know that, Job. But I'm telling you, you do. The Bible tells we have an enemy. And he says, deliver me not into the will of mine enemies. God won't do that. But let me tell you, we can set ourselves right into the path of the enemy. We can give in to his thoughts, his ideas, and intentions. You can be coerced and pushed and shoved and buffeted until you say yes to something you're not supposed to say yes to. But he said, deliver me because of mine enemies. Deliver me not to the will of mine enemies. For false witnesses, they're just plain liars, are risen up against me, such as breathe out cruelty. Here's what he said. But I would have fainted. I would have fainted unless I believed to see the goodness of God in the land of the living. Let me ask you a question. Where did he learn that? He, he's surrounded by liars. He's surrounded by deception. He's surrounded by the enemy who's coming against him. And he turned around and said, Man, I, I, if I'd have listened to that junk, I'd have been gone. But he said, I didn't because I really believed God to see the goodness of God in the land of the living. Where did he uh, Where did he? reason that where did he come up with that thought i'll tell you where he says in the next place and the next one because he says wait on the lord and be of good courage and he shall strengthen your heart wait i say wait on the lord wow i tell you where he got the revelation when all hell was breaking loose when his life was upside down when the doctors was giving him a bad report when his family didn't like him when the in-laws weren't talking to him and the goldfish is bellied up and breathing no more let me tell you something he was in the face of god he was in the presence of god he was waiting on the lord and in the midst of waiting on the lord god would speak to him and strengthen his heart so that he could get up and say say whatever you want to say do whatever you want to do but it's going to be all right it's going to be all right waiting on the lord is vital to your christian experience vital to your christian walk and vital to you for you fulfilling the plan that god has for you in your lifetime when you come to making major decisions and we all do whether what car to buy whether to get married to this person whether engaged or or whatever it is it, let me tell you something these are the big things of life Ask God. Don't make them decisions on your own. You'll get it wrong. Enemy will deceive you. Ask God. And then he'll, here's the big thing. Wait on his reply. Well, Joe, I haven't time to wait. I've got to sign this. No, let me sign nothing until you get a reply from heaven. Wait on the Lord. Ask him for wisdom. The Bible says in the book of James, if you ask for wisdom, he'll give it to you without giving off to you, without giving out to you. He says, you ask for wisdom. You ask for wisdom and ask for direction. What should I do, Lord? Where should we go? And then wait on that answer coming. It can come in many different ways and a variety of ways, but he'll answer you. For sure, he'll open a door or he'll close a door. He'll send somebody in or get you a book or a CD or a preacher. And sometimes, oh, let, me, let, me, let me help you here. Sometimes he just says, hold on. Nobody wants to hear that. 
when you've got a good idea, but it's not a God idea, when you've got something you want to do, but God doesn't want you to do it, he may just tell you to hold on. And the truth of it is, maybe it is a good idea, and maybe it is a God idea, but it's not the time. And he will tell you, hold on. Please don't fall out with God when he says, hold on. He's not rejecting your plea, and he's not rejecting your, pet your petition. He's just telling you to wait. I got something better. If you can hold on, you get a better price. If you can hold on, you get a better machine. If you can hold on, I've got somebody better for you. If you just hold on. Sometimes he says, hold on. You've got to get it right, you see. It's a skill and touch that you've got to get it right because if you don't, if you miss that plan, you can set your whole life back 10 years. You, you can be living in tears for the next five years because you stepped wrong. You, your life could be a misery for the next two years because you didn't wait. Because you didn't go, you didn't go, you didn't, you didn't linger in his presence, my goodness me. Samuel, the old prophet in the Old Testament, he came because God was moving kings. He was going to put Saul up and he was putting David in. And, and, and Saul came down to David's house, the house of Jesse. Jesse was his daddy. He wasn't the only boy of the house. And when, the so when, Solomon, uh, when Samuel the prophet came down in to anoint a king, he said to Jesse, one of your boys have come to anoint one of your boys as the next king. And uh, 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 Jesse uh, uh, rubbed his hands with glee and said, I'll bring them in. And he brought the first one. And he brought the second one. And he brought the third one and the fourth one and the fifth one. And eventually came to the last one except one. And, and he said, they're all here, all the good boys is here. And Samuel said, no, no, you must have something else. He said, well, there is one boy. He's still out in the fields. He's only a young fellow. But, and Samuel said, well, we won't do nothing to you, brought in. The minute David was brought in, Samuel said, this is he. This is the one. This is the king. Nobody else saw it in David. But this guy saw it. The anointed, the prophet saw it. Let me tell you something. David was 16 years old. 16 when the prophet walked in that day and said, you're going to be the king over all Israel. There's already a king on the throne when he said it, and that king's still a young man himself. It doesn't look like everything's secure, everything's safe, Israel's going good. It doesn't look like there's going to be anything shifting. But there's a God, God spoke to this man and said, go tell that boy, I choose him. He is my choice. David was 16 when that happened. Now write this down. For the next 14 years, David's life became a misery. He, he was running from the sword of Saul for the next 14 years. That's the king. This is the time he was living in the palace. This is the time he's working in there, but his life was under threat for the next 14 years. Sometimes he give me a word, Joe, prophesy to me, and then I give you a prophecy, and then he come back to me saying, but my life's upside down ever since you told me. And I know, I know, par for the course. So keep smiling and keep going on. You'll get to it. But let me tell you something. 16 years old and for the next 14 years now, he's running from the, from the sword of David. And for 14 years, Saul is trying to kill David. What a mess. For the next 14 years. And all David's doing for the next 14 years is trying to stay alive. He's trying to avoid the javelin. He's trying to avoid the ambushments that's coming against him. For 14 years, he's trying to stay alive, but he never forgets. He never forgets the day that that old prophet walked in and said, Son, you're God's choice. You are God's choice. Never forget. Look me in the eye and never forget this. You are God's choice. Sometimes I've got to remind myself that. Sometimes I've got to get close in the mirror that I can see my pupil of my eye. And I'll put my finger on I'll say, listen, it doesn't matter what they say. You're God's choice. Sometimes you've got to remind yourself, you're God's choice. Billy Ward, listen to me. You're God's choice. Owen, you're God's choice. Do you hear me? Toby, you're God's choice. Man may have rejected you, but God has chosen you. You may be living a nightmare like that night, but remember this. God has chosen you for such a time is this. This is your time. This is your season. You're God's choice. God has a perfect plan. It's a God a perfect plan, but it took time. It didn't happen instant. It took time. And for 14 years, David waited. Now there's a man who's another one would have turned around and wouldn't have waited 14 minutes or 14 weeks or 14 months. They'd have turned around and said, Ah, I don't believe that at all. David believed it. 
for 14 years. He never once tried to get ahead of God, nor did he lag behind God. For 14 years he stood with it. On two different occasions he had an opportunity to wipe Saul off the map. On two occasions he was a hair's breadth away with him. Saul was un unarmed and he had a weapon in his hands on two occasions. He could have stopped it there right and then he could have killed Saul right there and then. But something inside him said, it's, don't do it. It's not God's time and for you to be on that throne. You're not ready yet. And so he didn't. But God has always been working behind the scenes. God's working behind the scenes in your life and he's working behind the scenes in my life. He's turning things around. We've just got to learn to wait on him for the timing, for the directions. It's easy to get ahead of him, you know, because in a world where we can't wait for two minutes and we can hardly wait for an egg to boil, it's real easy then to get ahead of him if something doesn't happen in five years, it's easy then for the devil to deceive you when he turns around and tells you, oh, you've missed God, you've missed God, you've missed God. If you don't understand what I'm teaching you today, you'll probably fall for it and think, what's the sense? I'm away back fishing or something crazy. Well, let me tell you something. Read the Bible for yourself and find it. As you study in the Bible the other morning for myself, just heard of my devotions and I find this in Acts chapter 13 and verse 1. It says, now there was, Acts chapter 13 is a beautiful, beautiful whole chapter. There's a lot of stuff in that, in that chapter. I, I felt the call of God stirring me again when I read that just the other day. But it says in Acts 13 uh, and verse 1, it says, Now there was in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and si Simeon, that is called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manion, which was brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And as they ministered unto the Lord and fasted, listen to this now, the Holy Ghost said, Seven Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So being sent away forth, sent out by the Holy Ghost, they departed into Seleucia, and from then then they sailed to Cyprus. Now let me <coughs> back up to that particular word and show it. And as they ministered, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, the word for the work that I have called them to. Now, let me, let me tell you this. These are not new guys on the block. They, they, di they didn't come into the Holy Ghost service, put their hand up for salvation, and suddenly God's sending them out. These guys had been on the road for years and years and years. Maybe 15 years these guys had been in ministry. In ministry. And they happen to be again in a certain place. And, and, and the Holy Ghost comes and says, I, I'm now separating you from whatever you're doing over onto this. And what you're about to do is what you've actually been called to do from before the foundations of the world. So let me ask you a question then. What about the time before? What about two years before? What about five years before? What about the church, the pastor? What about the evangelistic stuff they've done? Does that mean nothing? Oh, yes, it does, sir. It was a part of the journey. It was a part of their preparation. That was a part of their Bible schooling. It was a part of the experiences they need to get them to this place. But one day God says, now you can enter into your destiny. Don't you know, sometimes we get, you go to Bible school. And some of us never went, but somebody will go to Bible school. You get all through this and you've pastored for 10 years and you think this is me. You may not have even got started yet. You may not even have been released yet. Or man might have released you. Man might have moved, moved you up to a bishop or a deacon or a cardinal. People, somebody may have called you something, but God hasn't. Till one day, you could be 20 years on ministry. You could be 30, 40 years in ministry. And one day God whispers in your ear, now I'm going to use you for what you were born to do. This is why. This is why we have got to keep in tune. This is why we've got to stay in there. This is why we've got to constantly listen because one word, one word from the Father, one word from the Holy Ghost changes the rest of your life. I'm telling you, it'll change the rest of your life. Waiting on the Lord is a skill and you've got to learn it and you've got to learn it fast because you're waiting on your orders. You're waiting on your direction. You've got to learn how to read the Bible methodically. You've got to read it over. So, you say, I've got to read a chapter a day. No, you don't. You may read two verses, and that sticks with you, and that's all you meditate on the rest of the day. You may read 20 verses, 20 chapters. Who knows? But you read until you get a nugget, until you find something. 
You got to learn to listen to the Holy Ghost. You got to learn to listen to his thoughts and to his ideas. And you've got to learn how to pray and pray effectively. And you've got to learn then how to talk to him out of, out of worship and devotion. And then sometimes you talk to him because a petition or a direction. And then sometimes it's warfare where you get up and you're taking authority over the enemy. But most of the times you're waiting on clear-cut direction. What do I do? When do I do it? How do I do it? If you listen for those directions, when the direction comes, you'll accomplish everything in your lifetime that God has called you to. And even if he says, not yet, and I've heard those words, uh, when he says, not yet, son, this isn't your time, I don't want you to go there, I don't want you to do this, that's fine. That's fine. Let me tell you, I've learned how to enjoy his company. I, I don't have to be going somewhere. I don't have to be doing anything to enjoy the company of my heavenly father. I've learned how to get in there and wait. Because when you wait, he comforts your heart. There's a peace that comes. He may say something to you that has nothing to do with anybody else. He may something to say something to you that is for somebody else. I, I, it makes no odds to me. I just like the company of my father. Yeah, as long as you make yourself available, and I do. And just this week again, I say to him, I'm available, you know. Whatever you want, whatever you, whatever you call me, I'm, I'm available. What is it you want me to do? And I'll be there for you. Psalm 25 and verse 3 says, Yeah, let none that wait on thee be ashamed. Let me tell you, there's another translation that says, You'll never be disappointed. If you learn to wait on him, You'll never be disappointed. There's many disappointments in life. But if you learn to wait on his presence, he'll guide you. He'll bring you through. And let me tell you, then, then there's a peace that passes all understanding will come in any and every crisis that ever comes into your life. Let me read you Psalm 37 and verse 1. I like this. It says, fret not. That's not a word we use that often. Uh, the word fret, it means burn up with anger. <laughs> it means to be overly jealous. But he says, don't be overly jealous. Don't be burned up with anger uh, uh, because of evildoers. Neither be envious against the workers of iniquity. For they are soon cut down like grass and wither away like a green herb. Do you ever notice you think, man, the wicked get away with everything? They're driving the nice cars and I'm not. They're, they're living in a nice house and I'm not. They're, they're cleaning out. They're robbing. They don't pay their taxes. They're, 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 they're cheating right, left, and center. And they live some kind of big life. No, they're not. It's a charade, it's a, it's a camouflage, it's nothing, it's an empty life. They don't sleep well at night. I do, I hope you do too. But let me tell you, says, he says, don't worry about them, don't be jealous over them, don't be envious of them, for they come one day and then they're cut down like grass and they wither like a green herb. But you trust in the Lord and do good, and so shall you dwell in the land, and verily you shall be fed and fed plenty. And let me tell you, he says, delight yourself in the Lord, <coughs> and he will give you the desires of your heart. He'll put the desires on the inside of you so that you can say, God, I want this. And then he says, verse 5, he says, now commit that way unto the Lord, trust in him, and he'll bring it to pass. Well, your life should be fruitful. Your life should be productive. There should be always something going on because you go into his presence, he puts a desire in, you start asking for the desires, the next thing you're doing it, you're having it, you're wanting it, he'll bring it to pass. Rest in the Lord, and listen, wait patiently for him. Wait patiently for him. Fret not because of them that prosper in the way, because of a man that bringeth wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself in any wise to do evil. Don't do like they do. And verse 9 says, For evildoers shall be cut off, but they that wait on the Lord shall inherit the earth. In other words, you get everything that's due to you in his time. Did you get that? Other people are, are cheating, they're lying, they're deceiving to try to get something that's worthless and of no value. But if you'll do what's right, let me tell you something. He'll get everything to you in your time, in your lifetime. You will fulfill it. God, he said, I'm watching over your stuff. I'm watching over you. His hand is covering you, ladies and gentlemen. His hand is covering you. You just got to learn to wait. If you'll wait upon the Lord, he'll provide everything that's necessary for you to fulfill the dream that he'll put in your heart. But hold on, Joe. Wait a minute, wait a minute now. Wait a minute. I didn't get saved until I was 70. I didn't get saved until I was 80. What about me, Joe? What about me? I, I, I'm talking to you. 
And I know that I'm talking to people that missed God. And I know I'm talking to people that you, you made it wrong and to admit the wrong decisions. And you know it. You, you know it. And I know it. You're paying the price right now. You know it. But what about that, people? Is there no chance then? If you miss it, is it gone forever? There's a thing called the grace of God. And what it is, there's a secondary plan. So what do you do if God had planned for you to do something when you're 20? It was the beginning of something. You go through this door, it would lead to this. And by the time you're 30, it's, you know, it's up and running. But here you are, 60. You can't go back to 20 and start over again. What, what about that? I know. I know. It's dreadful. And my advice to you is don't even sit and think like that. Don't be thinking about it. But there is a secondary plan. And so there's things that, that now you're not physically capable of doing. There's things that, there's things that I, I, I'm 60, I'm a 60s now, and I, there's things that I can't do, and things I can't do that I did when I was 20 and 26. Can't do that now. But does that mean I'm out of the runnings? No, it doesn't mean you're out of the runnings. You've got something else for you. Let me tell you, the work in the kingdom never stops. If he doesn't do this, it's the what you were born to do. But if the, whatever happened, you blew it or whatever, let me tell you, it's not all finished. It's not all over. You come to him and you repent. Say, dear God, if I had the chance, I'd never do that again. Help me, Lord. Repent. Forgive me. Cleanse me. Called the grace of God comes upon you. He'll give you something else. To you, it'll be the, it'll be the bee's knees. It'll, it'll just be fantastic. It'll be wonderful. God will get the job done. He'll get it done. He is the God of a second chance third chance and fourth a million chances so please don't write yourself off psalm 40 this is where we started we're a big circle now psalm 40 in verse 1 i waited patiently for the lord oh you'll come a time when you can say that you've got to practice to get there but i waited patiently for the lord now listen what happened when he waited he said and god inclined unto me and he heard my cry. He brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the merry clay. He set my feet upon a rock. He established my goings, and he put a new song in my mouth. So here's what he said. He inclined. The word inclined means he leaned over towards me. Do you know, you know what I mean? If, 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 if 17 people was talking to you at the same time, and you'd want to hear this people in particular, you'd turn and say, What? What? And you'd lean towards him. That's what the Bible says. Whenever you wait patiently, Lord, he leans in your direction. He cocks his ear in your direction, almost like, what's that, son? What is it now? Isn't that something else? He leans in, he inclines, he leans in your direction. And the, the next two words, fantastic. He heard me. He heard me. When you know he heard you, there may be no significant move. There may no the infection may still be in the wound. The 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 the, the whatever it is, the, the check's not through yet, but let me tell you, when no when you know he heard you, why well, you'll smile and you'll sleep because you know things will start to come aright for you. Here's what he said, and he brought me up. In other words, he lifted me out of. Wherever you are, the mess that you're in when, when you've got no plans, no purpose, and here you are and you're 40 and you're 50, you're 26, here you are and your life's going in circles. The Bible says when you learn to wait patiently in the Lord, he lifts you out of that mess. He lifts you right off that road and the Bible says he set my feet. In other words, he puts the feet in the right direction. The compass of your life starts to go in the right direction and he establishes your paths. So I don't care how far off you've gotten this direction, how far off you're getting the direction. When you learn to wait on the Lord, he'll put you back on track. <coughs> it may be a different track to get you back to where you need to go, but he'll put you back on track and he'll establish your, your goings. And he says he'll put a new song on your mouth. I can guarantee you this. There's a joy comes just knowing you're in the will of God. You'll sing yourself to sleep. You'll whistle during the day. There'll be a hmm, 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 start to come on the inside of you when you know you've got a plan and a purpose and you're in the will of God and that comes through the person who waits patiently on the Lord. There's things that he still has ahead of you. Just the other day I was, I was, I was doing something and I started to sit and reminisce. I, I reminisced about a place I was, a nation that I was in and I'd done multiple meetings and multiple services and tell you what's up, my, I can't even remember all the churches that I went in in one, in one mission trip but I started to think about those fellas, I thought about those meetings, I thought about the Holy Ghost and how people were giving their life to Jesus, I thought about the prophecy and I did, it all came flooding back and I took a deep sigh and said, man, that was great. But no matter how great that was, there's even better 
ahead. If you wait patiently in the Lord, Lord, Lord will take all that stuff and put it to the background and say, come on, I'll show you this. He delights in you. He wants to show you something fantastic. The Bible said in 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 9, he says, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for him that love him. There's no man has ever seen what God's going to show you. There's no man has ever heard the things he's going to, going to tell you. There's no man is ever going to do the things that God has for you to do. You'll miss it if you don't wait in his presence. If you'll wait. You, you just have to have a secret place. You've got to have a place you meet him. It may be your car. <laughs> it may, just meet with him every day. And let me tell you something. He'll begin to allow you access into something you've not had access into. You'll end up hearing things, doing things, having, you'll have dreams. You, you'll do things you've never done before. Not because you went to Bible school. You don't learn this in Bible school. <laughs> no. not, not, not because they call you by a title. No. But because you spend time at the Master's feet. And when you're in that place, I tell you, life changes and life changes forever. We're on the last scripture now and we're winding down. In Isaiah 40 and verse 28, it says, Have you not known... Have you not even heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, see right there, see right there, three names of God. He said, the everlasting God. He's eternal, he's everlasting. The Lord, ah, that's who he is. Is he Lord of your life yet? All right, he's the creator of the ends of the earth. This is who he is. He wants to talk to your life. Uh, the power of God wants to sit in your, in your kitchen, in your truck, in your bedroom, the creator of the ends of the earth. He faints not. He doesn't get fed up listening to you. He doesn't get tired. He's not onto the weather. He doesn't have a bad hair day. It's not messed up. Hey, let me tell you, he doesn't faint. Neither does he grow weary. I know. I'm sure, God, you're tired of listening to me. No, he's not. He never will. I might get tired of listening to you, but God won't. He never gets tired listening to you. He never grows weary. And there's no searching of his understanding. In other words, there's no limit to the answers that he has. He's unlimited in, 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 in everything about him. Now listen to verse 29. I was only verse 28. Let me get to 29 now. Listen to this. He gives power to the faint. Wow. That's what those who think they can't. Those that's limited. Those that's what we say here in Northern Ireland, bogged down. To those that's trapped to those that stuck. He gives you his power. He gives you power to the faith. And to them that have no might, no might, he increases strength. Now, how's he going to do this? In his presence. When you learn to wait on him, here's what happens to you. Let me tell you what happens. He begins to put strength, confidence, boldness, power, ideas, energy, thoughts on the inside of you. So even the youth shall faint and be weary. And young men will utterly fall, but here it is, verse 31. Got a hold of this. But they that wait upon the Lord, I hope now I'm talking directly to you, you could put their name down and say, and say, when I wait upon the Lord, because here's what will happen directly to you. When they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength, they'll mount up with wings as eagles, they'll run and they'll not be weary, they'll walk and they'll not be faint. Now let me bring that to you in a manner that you can truly understand. They that wait upon Wait upon the Lord. The word wait upon means to eagerly look. Eagerly look. Expecting. Expecting something. It means that somebody comes in and they're giving away free ice cream. Or they're giving away $20 bills. Or they're giving away 50 euro bills. Or they're coming in here and they're bringing 100 pound sterling notes in here. And they're having to give them out to the first six rows. And you're sitting on the seventh row. I'll tell you what way you'd be looking. Expecting. You would get the sweat rubbed off your hand. You'd, get, you'd give your wallet to, the, to your wife and say, can you hold that amount of dollars? There's something coming to me here. And, and, all, and almost as soon as they turn the curb and come into your hand, your hand would be up. You wouldn't even have to say, is there something for me? Oh, no, no, no. Your hand would rise because you're looking expectantly. They that wait upon the Lord, the word to wait upon the Lord, it means to sit there expecting to receive something. Did you get that? That's how you wait on the Lord. It's not finished there because this word wait on the Lord actually means to linger in his presence. Oh, I like that even better. 
to linger. The, when I thought about this word linger, I've always thought of it this way. Uh, when, when Laura and I was, was, was going with each other, and she is madly in love with me, you know. Uh, okay. I, the, we were madly in love with each other. You know how it is? When you, when you hold each other at night, you, you give a little kiss goodbye, and you almost don't want to, you don't want to part. You, you just, you, you don't want to leave each other. And sort of days, you, you know, you say, and, and you're holding hands, you say, I'll see you tomorrow. I'll see you, I'll, I'll call you, I'll call you. And you're still holding her hand, and she has got to go, and, and, and you and you got to go, and you're pulling, pulling, and you're stretching, holding on, and the next thing is just your fingertips are touching, and then I have to let go, and even then you're still waving and blowing kisses. Blowing kisses, lingering. You don't want to go. See, this is why he says, waiting on the Lord. Come in there expecting something with this lingering, lingering in his presence. He said, if you do that, they will renew. The word renew means to sprout up like new grass. Like, new, like the first fruits that comes up. So that's what will happen. New, new growth will start. New things will begin to happen. New ideas will begin to flood your soul. They that wait eagerly or linger in the presence of the Lord, they'll begin to have new ideas. There's a freshness comes in them. They'll renew their strength. The word strength is resilience or power or confidence or might. There's something about this. When you linger in the presence of God, when he begins to share and talk with you, read his word, let me tell you something. There's a confidence comes. There's a resilience that comes and says, I'm not lying down to this. <coughs> Instead, he says, they'll mount up with wings as eagles. The word mount up means to go up. I like this even better because you can write go up, comma, to go up and over. There's some limitations in your life. You say, I've never got over them. You will now. If you wait in the presence of God, expecting to receive some, lingering in this presence, he says, you'll mount up. You'll not just go up, but you'll go up and over. The old limitations will be broken. It says you'll run. It simply means to move more quickly. Oh, isn't that exciting to move more quickly? So we haven't moved in 40 years. Some of, you haven't, some of you haven't done anything in the kingdom for a long time. Some of you have been doing, but it's so, so, so slow. Linger in his presence a while. He'll give you one thought, one idea. He'll say something, and all of a sudden you're shooting forward. You're moving forward and making the right moves. And making the right. It's one thing moving. So not only making the right moves, but you'll make the right moves. You'll buy into the right business. You'll make the right deposits. You'll make the right phone calls. The right person will step into your life. Have you got to hold that? And you'll run and you'll not be weary. And then he says, and you'll walk. The word walk means to make progress. <coughs> See, that's another thing. To make progress or to proceed, to get going, to get going, make progress in your life. It also means to no longer be stuck and get you out of whatever you're in. No longer be stuck. You might never have to go back to the same factory. You might never have to make the same bricks that you made before. God might have something phenomenal, something fantastic, something confisticular. There's a word and a half. That'll get you thinking about your dictionary. God's got something super frumpious. Tell you, God, I, I don't even have words to describe it. I don't have words to describe what God's going to do with you. You'll never be stuck again when you get into the presence of God. And he says you'll walk and you'll not faint. The word faint is mean to be over-anxious, fatigued, or over-worried. So you get into the presence of God. You won't be over-worried. There's no need to be anxious anymore. You won't feel fatigued. You'll not go to bed exhausted at night because of having to work, 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 and seeing no results at the end of it when you work for Jesus. When you spend time. See, you're on this earth. You're not in this earth to make money for somebody else. Now, that's, we have to make money for to put bread and butter on the table. That's what we got to do. A lot of people are not content with that. And if you learn how to be content, you wouldn't have to work half the hours you do for to buy something you don't really want anyway when you get it. Um, come on. You can do it. Yeah, it's not why you're on the earth. You're on the earth to bring glory to Almighty God. He has put something on the inside of you to establish and something to fulfill. Oh, you may do all types of work, but in your lifetime, you need to get in his presence. You need to linger in his presence. And whatever he says, do it. He may tell you to jump course all the He may tell you to pull the plug. He may tell you to walk away. He may tell you to go. Huh? Who knows what he'll tell you? But whatever he says is for your benefit, is for your good, is for your life. At the end of the day, it's God's plan, not yours. 
At the end of the day, it's fulfilling God's purpose, not yours. And you're here to do a phenomenal thing. You are a phenomenal person anyway. But just think when you're on the plan of God, on the purpose of God, it's exciting. It's exciting because there's something to be learned every day. I'm learning every day. I'm learning every day. I'm, I'm, yeah. This is when I was at school. I wasn't the smartest, smartest cookie on the block. Let me tell you, after I left school and uh, it got saved, man, I had to go back and study and study and study. I never stopped studying. I have no intention to stop studying, start and stop and study. But I've been in there, just sitting in the presence of God, and he talks to you. And he doesn't talk to you like some sort of peon, even though you've missed it or, or messed it up. He doesn't talk to you like you're, like you're some piece of rubbish just sitting there. He talks to you like a king. He talks to you like you're an ambassador. He talks to you like you're the only person that matters at that moment of time. He lifts your heart to a whole new place. He's beckoning you. He's welcoming you. He's talking to you. He calls you by your name. He knows you. He knows where you are. He knows who you are. And he knows where you're stuck. He holds the answer. He may give you the answer in the first 15 seconds. It may be 15 days. And what he'll tell you might just not come to pass for the next 15 years. But there's something about knowing that you're not on the rubbish heap of life there's something about knowing that, that, that you were born for such a time as this that makes life worth living. I pray you get something out of this today. In fact, I know you got something out of this today. Run to the room and say, God, I'm here. Be like me. I'm stupid enough just to go and say, I don't know how to do this. So, Holy Spirit, you're my teacher. Would you teach me what to do? Teach me how to pray. Teach me how to love God. He did. He'll teach you. i got to close here. But thank you for uh, tuning in today. And if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior, then none of these things that I'm saying matters. Because you're on a downward slope. Your life is lost. You've got no hope. But to those who will make Jesus Lord, that's you I'm talking to. Your life is purpose. Hey, you might be 80 years of age. What am I going to do, Joe? I don't know, but it's something phenomenal. He will not let you off the face of the earth without letting you be in on the journey of life yourself. Come on, it's your time. It's your moment, it's your time. Make that decision and make it now. Why don't you just contact us on, on uh, uh, Facebook or email or, or whatever way you do it. Let, let me know where you are, and who you are and what you're watching. But we're praying for your nation. We're praying for your pastors and we're praying for your country. And I know some of you this week, uh, uh, our nation's still in lockdown. And I know some of your nations are beginning to open. And I've already instructed our prayer teams to pray that your, uh, that your churches will be flooded with people as you begin to open your churches again. I know you say, I've only allowed 50 people or 150 people. I pray there's 300 knocks on the door to get in and you'll have to do it in two sittings and I pray that you've been preparing for this moment in the midst of lockdown but I would say God bless you whatever you're doing do it with a smile and do it unto the Lord see you next time bless you <laughs>